Uh, yeah, the American system. New national bank, tariffs, and internal improvements. The Missouri Compromise is basically is right here. It's, yeah, okay. it's, it relates to a compromise over slavery, right? You have this issue of representation in the federal government. I mean, remember the, the three-fifths compromise? Where the South wants to include the slave population because they want to have more representation in they want to have more power in Congress and in the federal government. And so every time a new state is added to the Union, this issue would come up at, to, to, uh, on, at some, in some form or another because as a new state is added, that means that that state gets senators and Congress rep congressional representation, right? Sen two senators from each state and then congressional rep representatives based on population. And that's the legislative branch, right, Congress. And also electoral votes to, de to decide the president. So there's a lot of potential uh, influence in how the federal government's going to look based on whether that's, you know, how many votes, like, how, many, you know, uh, how many states are added and how many, you know, and whether or not those states have slavery or not, basically. If you want a government, a federal government that's going to protect slavery, that's going to be friendly to the slave states, you want to control, you know, then you want to have... Then you're, you need to have a situation where if new states are being added, some of those states have to be slave states where slavery is legal. Because if they're all free states, then, then and you know, and slavery is, that, that, that's really the issue, one of the issues behind the Civil War. There's a lot of people that say slavery was going to die out and it wasn't really a big part of the Civil War. But as new states are added, if slavery just stays here, then eventually there are going to be more free states, way more free states, and they're going to outlaw slavery. There's a fear of that, or there, or there, you know, and there's the, the slave states will have will be a, a minority, a significant minority in the government, right? They'll never be able to control a majority because they'll never have more senators, or you know, stuff like that. So, so as new states are added, there's always this sort of making sure that some of them are slave states is like guaranteed. So the Missouri Compromise is when Missouri wants to enter the Union as a slave state, and people in the North say no. The compromise is that basically Maine. Uh, Maine, which breaks off from Massachusetts, right up there. Maine used to be a part of Massachusetts. It becomes a state, and it's a free state. Missouri enters the Union as a slave state, and then this line is created. It's called the Mason-Dixon line. So, and this Mason-Dixon line, this this the red line. Basically, it says it says slavery in the Louisiana territory, not across the whole country, but not across the whole continent, but in the Louisiana territory, which is this. Which actually, officially, a lot of people don't know this, this, this ter Louisiana territory, the Louisiana Purchase, which included Louisiana, the, uh, basically Louisiana, um, Arkansas territory, Ar this, Ar what becomes Oklahoma and Arkansas, Missouri and all this, it's actually renamed Missouri territory after Louisiana becomes a state, to avoid confusion. But no, like, but, so anyways, then in, that, in this territory that was purchased from France, that slavery will not exist above this line, right? So Missouri is actually above the line. Missouri's up here, and it's come, it comes in as a slave state, but then everything, but they say, okay, for, across this, everything below here, you can have slavery if you want, but it can't exist up above that. So it creates, so like the Northwest Ordinance, which affected these states, these states are affected by the Northwest Ordinance, right, where they say slavery won't exist. It, cre it further creates this regional distinction, right? Everyone, heard, you know, who remembers like that day in high school where you talked about it and you kind of don't really remember what, it's all, you know. It's part of, it's actually, the Monroe Doctrine is actually part of the uh, State of the Union Address. It, the, when usually it's someone's name, like a president's name and doctrine, it relates to their foreign policy. What is their doctrine in relation to dealing with other nations? So the Truman Doctrine after World War II, uh, the Reagan Doctrine. So the, the Monroe Doctrine is actually something written, in, it's part of his speech to Congress that outlines his foreign policy. But this uh, speech, I, po this portion was actually written by his Secretary of State, James Monroe, who is the fifth, fifth president. John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, actually is his Secretary of State and writes this part of the speech, the Monroe Doctrine, which basically says, in 18, it's in 1823, right? Uh, 18, in 1821, Mexico had achieved independence from Spain. So Mexico becomes independent and all these other countries that in South America become independent of European colonial rule. The Monroe Doctrine basically says to European countries, the entire hemisphere, right, North and South America, if you, if you have stuff here now that you claim as colonial territory, fine. But if, if anything that's independent now needs to stay that way. Anybody that becomes independent down the road, you need to just respect that and not try to reassert your authority.
right? Or else it'll be a problem. Like basically assert, basically kind of asserting that in, a, in sort of a paternalistic, the, the Americas are a family sort of thing. Like, and this is our, our turf and you, your turf is over there in the old world and we won't get involved in your business in Europe and you just, you don't, you, you stay out of our business here basically. And that's kind of in a situation that, that's honored by the United States at least for almost 100 years. It's not until World War I that the United States gets involved in any European wars. Chapter 10 is called Democracy in America. It is a term, it is a term uh, that comes from a book published in 1835 by a guy named Alexis de Tocqueville, who is actually French. It is considered the definitive, it, it is in many ways the definitive book on America, like the American character or what it means to be an American, like the ideas that Americans have about democracy, equality, politically, how we see each other as being equal, and how it's distinct from Europe. Because he's coming from France, and this is about, 1835 is about 50 years after the revolutionary period, right? So America's still young, but it's about a half a century later. All the early framers of the government are, de are dead. This is like basically several generations later. And how is this, and he's like since looking at it, see, writing about how is, how is this country developed that has made it markedly different from Europe? It really feeds into this idea of American, this, if you may have heard this term, American exceptionalism. America, because, because there wasn't a crazy like, in, economic inequality early on, you know, there were, there were wealthy landowners and there were poor people, but it wasn't as, as divided as it, is, it was in Europe. Old, entrenched wealth, and also people who were peasants who were very poor. In America, that kind of didn't exist, and so it allowed for a society to develop that embraced equality, democracy, because people were generally more equal. And it's important to note that this, when he's talking about these things, that when, when I'm talking about these things, it, it's, it, it generally applies to white Americans, right? Or white male Americans. This idea at this time is called, they, they, there's actually an expansion of voting rights. It's known as universal manhood suffrage or universal white male suffrage, where the property qualifications for voting used to have property, need property to vote. If you didn't own property, you couldn't vote. That's going to go away. And all men, all white men, like white men are given the right. It just, it, this seems really antiquated, right? It seems, does not seem really progressive in our own time. But at the time it was, there were more people in America who could vote than in countries in Europe. Way more, like a lot more people. But it's limited to white male voters, Americans, right? And there are actually states before this where they had, if you owned property, you could vote. There were black people that owned property, some women who owned property. Not a lot, but there were there, and they could vote. And, there, and so those people like, lose their voting rights. It's basically the property thing is removed. So hey, even if, you don't, even if you're not like, a property owner, everybody can vote, right? But it really, it be, then it becomes applied, it be, but voting rights be, basically become attached to white, being white and male. So that's an important, it's like, it's like a real, a real important asterisk or footnote that this, there's, there's some genuine, the idea about expanding democracy, this is when the popular vote is going to start being counted. If you look at the early elections, the, like Washington's election, Jefferson's election, you're not going to see, uh, if you look at an electoral map, they won't show you a popular vote count. They didn't, they just, they, you chose an elector, and that elector, like a delegate, went and sat with other delegates from that state, and they chose who, who they wanted to be president. It's not until 1824, if you look at the ele election results, where you're actually going to see states counting the popular vote, where the, like more people are voting, at least among you know, white people, white men, and 90% of the adult white male population could vote, is eligible to vote. It's significantly smaller in Europe. Uh, they're called, these newspapers come out, they're called the penny press because they cost a penny. Really clever, right? Because newspaper, the, there were other newspapers back then, there were fewer, and they cost six cents. And they usually just discuss like financial news and other stuff. This is really the era where like the journalism we know of today comes about, where there are crime stories, there's politics, a lot of these, a lot of the, almost all these newspapers are controlled by a particular political party too. So when we think of the news today, we think, oh, it's so they're so biased or they're so partisan. Like there's MSNBC, which is like the liberal Democratic news station, and then there's Fox, which is the crazy station. Now there was a conservative station. Like every newspaper was like that. They were either on the Whig side or the Democrat side, and they were very partisan. But they also had stories about crime and since like OJ, you know OJ, like the OJ Simpson trial. That sort of that sort of news where it's sensational you know, dramatic stuff, um, that was in these newspapers. One, one, was, one big story was in 1836 in New York City, there was a prostitute who was murdered, and there was a giant 
trial around it. And it was this big scandal. It was like the OJ trial of the 1830s. Really big, big deal. Like, and, all, and these newspapers covered it. And it was like very descript. They would go to the crime scene and like, oh, it was the, the whole idea of being like a journalist being on site at the crime scene and describing it in a newspaper was new. Now we have cameras everywhere and we do all that stuff. But back then it was like not something that people wrote about in newspapers. So it was, it's sort of all, a lot of, so and, and, and newspaper and read, I mean, this is, you're talking about providing a published information, like news that people, everybody's reading and you're making, and you're designing it so that everybody can read it. Right when literacy rates are, are much lower in other in European countries at this time, so more Americans can, are literate. Remember that, and, and remember that as, the foot, the asterisk, because it's, this is applying to basically white Americans back then. But a lot of, but a lot of the, the problem is a lot of these people didn't see that contradiction. They didn't see the contradiction of well, yeah, but only a small group of people, not everybody. Like you know, slaves, slaves are 95% illiterate. 95% of slaves can't read or write. Kind of a, on the one hand, it's, it's sort of a they're they're ahead, they're ahead of the curve. They're more progressive than other European countries as far as voting rights, as far as literacy, public education starts spreading. But there's also the issue that this is only applying to one ethnic group, really male, male white men. There's this very it's a very stratified stratified society. Are you upset? I didn't make these rules, guys. Why are you guys giving me dirty? I didn't I didn't create this. Work. I didn't do this. I wasn't even around. I don't agree with it. It's cool. I think everyone should vote. I think people in prison should vote. Some people, you know, I think people, I mean, when, when they're in prison, I think people should get to vote. Totally. Even if they're, even if they're on death row, because, I mean, like some crazy, some like Charles Manson type, he's only one guy. He only has one vote. It's not like there's 50 million Charles Mansons out there, like, going to vote for Donald Duck and Donald Duck's president. So this era, this, this whole time period, and w one of the um, centerpieces of this era is the uh, election of President Andrew Jackson. He's on the $20 bill. You know, he's got that really cool pompadour hairstyle on the $20 bill. Andrew Jackson, when you think of the president, people think of Abraham Lincoln as the, what is he, the log, log cabin president, right? The common man president, this co like, like populism. When George Bush was president, people said he was the kind of guy you wanted to sit down and have a beer with. Andrew Jackson is one of the first president, is really the first president that sort of is marketed that way. It's portrayed as this, he's from the frontier, he's from Tennessee. He's from the, so he's the first president, prior to Andrew Jackson, every single president, there were six of them. The first six, four of them are from Virginia, two of them are from Massachusetts. And the two from Massachusetts are father and son, John Adams and John Quincy Adams. So, and they're, from, and they're lawyers, and then the Virginia, uh, so that you have the, so the first six presidents are from the two oldest British colonies, right? Massachusetts, Virginia. And so Andrew Jackson uh, is the first who is not from, who's from a new, new area, new state, Tennessee. So, this, so there are actually, these are the, the idea of political parties that we think of today really comes about in this era. The Whigs are one party, and that's the year, that, that's around the time they come about, and the Democrats, right? And this, and Andrew Jackson is elected. He runs in 1824 and loses. There's a lot of drama behind it. And then in 1828, he runs again and is elected, and he's president. And he, uh, the, uh, so Jackson is, is president, uh, has, as president, has a very negative record, a very poor record on his relations with Indian nations. It is, this is a period that's referred to as basically Indian removal, the removal of Indians beyond, of Indian nations past west of the Mississippi, right? This idea, and this is this this it's, it, this is not. But this is prior to the term "manifest destiny" being used. This idea that America is going to cross this entire continent and occupy the, the, the entire you know this this whole stretch of land is going to be part of the United States. It's going to be this huge landmass where everyone's going to get a piece of land and blah like blah blah blah. Right. This precedes that. This that that term hadn't come into use, but it really relates to this idea of American expansion. Territories opening up for Americans, and which really, for most people, meant white Americans. A really racist um, mindset, or you know, uh, with, with that. And the idea that indigenous people had to leave, even if they, regardless of how long they lived in these places, and also regardless of the fact that many of them, prior to this, there had been treaties signed recognizing borders, like the Washington administration, Jefferson administration. They would sign treaties, negotiate treaties with Indian nations where they figured out what the, what the territory that nation occupied. And then the idea was when people, the U.S. started, you know, more states started being added and they were migrating west, that they would respect those borders and, and, and move around them. 
right? E and even though, but at, e even even with those treaties, you had Americans who would violate the treaty and move into the move into the, to the land and just not even ignore the ignore the treaty, basically, and it would cause conflict. But there was an attempt, at least, there was an attempt by people to respect the rights of the original inhabitants of this of the Americas, right? These indigenous nations. Uh, Jackson basically says, no, we're, we're, like not even gonna, we're not even going to follow those treaties. We're just going to remove people. And it really culminates the main, uh, uh, the main event around this that related to Indian removal happens after he's left office, but his vice president is in office, Martin Van, Van Buren, because he leaves office in, in, uh, in March of 1837. And then the, next, the following year, the winter of 1838-39, uh, they're is what's known as the Trail of Tears. Some of you may have heard about this. The United States Army, the United States, this is a quotation from the book. The United States Army forced 18,000 Cherokee men, women, and children into stockades, right? Corral into stockades, and then forced them to move west, like walk, primarily walking. At least one quarter died, perished, during the winter of 1838 39. 18,000 people, one quarter of them, so that's about four and a half thousand. Right, four and a half. Yeah, four thousand. Yeah, four and a half. That four and a half. So forty-five hundred people died. Right, in one winter. Move, move it because they're they're on, basically on a forced march of about I don't know twelve hundred miles, fifteen hundred miles, a very long distance. So at least one quarter perish as the removal route from Georgia to the area of present-day Oklahoma. So and, and it was in it was a winter. And they're also, I mean, they're being, they're basically being put, on, being put on a forced march by the United States Army. And this is in a country that has a lot of, that clearly has a lot of issues with uh, white supremacy and racism, right, in the mid-1800s. So the, the idea, so the, it's, it's probably safe to say that a lot of them were not treated very well. We're not given, the, like, enough food or even good stuff or were abused, right? A lot of people, you know, it's not just people necessarily, but there were probably of those four and a half thousand people, not all of them just sort of, were tired or exhausted and, and passed and fell and died. Right, a lot of them could have been beat. It could have been physically abused, or raped. You know, raped people who were sexually assaulted, all sorts of stuff. People who were shot, just you know, it, in in the in the Cherokee language, it um, actually literally means the trail on which we cried. So the trail of tears. It's not one. It's not one trail. It's like the Underground Railroad was not an actual railroad. The trail of tears was not one. Trail. Not all 18,000 were mar were like taken in one thing, you know, on one trail. But it was. I mean, some of them were transported by on, on river. There were certain routes that were partially river, and and different routes that they marched through. And it was you know a series of them. And so over the course of this winter, basically, because you're you know, you've got different. The army was basically rounding people up, force you know. It, it was almost like these you know you think of these immigration sweeps that ICE does, where they go into a business and, and round up people, and all of a sudden they're gone. You know, like that whole thing, like basically forcing people. To, you can't stay here. You have to leave. It's, de it's deportation is really what it is. It's deportation, essentially. Only they're not deporting people who migrated there. They're deporting the people who were, had been there for hundreds of years, you know, thousands of years. So it's called the Trail of Tears.